things. And so that first one that I mentioned was making sure that our, our materials are relevant. And so I've been pushing lately and been working a lot with, um, we're making an OPI hub course right now about using local data and um, making sure that when we're teaching, especially science, that that science is coming from um, an area that our kids can relate to. And so that's one of the big things, making sure that it's current and up-to-date data. A lot of our, our textbooks traditionally um, are outdated. And so using stuff, especially with the internet um, being a great resource. When I talk about intertwine, I'm really looking at two things. I'm looking at how we can incorporate multiple disciplines and also multiple um, standards at the same time. Um, when we hear of having new, like NGSS, and, and as Montana adapted that to our new science standards, a lot of people think it just being extra work, and we want to eliminate that um, filling. And so by incorporating several of these things into each lesson, it, it doesn't seem like extra work. You're hitting a lot of, um, checking a lot of those standards off all at once. Um, making sure that we're using the current standards. And so when I look at those, how are we incorporating the common core in our classroom? How is Indian Ed for All being implemented in that? And how does that relate with NGSS? And I'm gonna go a little more in depth later about kind of the, the keys of NGSS and Indian Ed for All that I consider to be the current and most important pieces to look at in your rooms. And then finally, my last kind of bullet on being the change is making sure that our work is student driven. And so the, the question that I constantly ask at the end of even a lesson, at the end of a, when I have my first break for the day, I, I just try to ask myself, who is doing the, the heavy lifting? Who's doing a lot of the, the thinking and, and all that? And if I constantly see myself being the one that's been leading all of the discussions, that's been doing the heavy lifting um, and the talking, then I, I need to think about a different way to get my students really running um, the show. And I think by using Indian Ed for All, it, that's one of many ways um, that we can get buy-in from a lot of our students, and especially um, our Native American students. So I guess um, many of you are obviously at the Best Practices Conference because you understand the importance of integrating Indian Ed for All. But I think, um, I think it's important that we really talk about why why it's important to use with our students. Um, so recently, my wife and I traveled to Salt Lake City and we were in the city and we were looking um, for like a quick hike that we could do um, in the area. And we had our youngest daughter with us. And so we didn't want it to be too long. And we were looking around and we saw that right behind the Capitol building, there's a, a short trail that takes you to Ensign Peak. Um, kind of reminiscent to like the M trail other than with the switchbacks, it's a little more um, straight up and a little bit shorter. And so um, me being a history a nerd, I wanted to, to go up there and read all the signs that they had along the way. And so we started walking up um, Ensign Peak. And when you get to the top, it overlooks the Salt Lake uh, Valley and it's beautiful. And, and along the way, um, especially at the top, there's several signs. There's an old survey map of the Salt Lake Valley where they talk about the different drainages and where Salt Lake is. And there's a lot of signs about um, when the Mormons uh, or the Latter-day Saints first came into um, that part of Utah. Um, two days after coming into the Salt Lake Valley, Brigham Young and seven other um, Mormons, uh, elders or people uh, of the party that were there, they climbed to the top of that peak and kind of planned out where uh, they were gonna lay the city and where buildings were gonna be built. And Brigham Young said that that peak had been shown to him in several of his visions. And so that happened in 1847. And so we read all these signs at the top and then we go back down to the bottom of the hill and there's a whole park there. And there's several historical signs all talking about um, the vision that Brigham Young had, talking about how many people came over um, with that first group of Latter-day Saints um, and all of the, the things that they noticed and why Ensign Peak was so important to them. Um, and so in 1934, they built a monument at the top and then in 1996, the, the city and the state of Utah have made it a park and there's funding to maintain this park and these historical signs. And at the very bottom, there's one, one sign about the Native Americans that were in the area prior um, to this exploration party. And I think the reason this was, uh, 
I noticed this right away. And I, and I think the, the importance is it really gets us back to this idea that history is very subjective and it's all through the eyes of the storyteller. If you'd never been familiar with the area and you didn't understand or know a lot about um, the Native American tribes, the indigenous people that lived in the area, you might have thought that these were the first people to settle in the area. And, and all the signs would have said that. And so it's not to say that these signs are incorrect. I mean, the history was great. I loved reading all the signs, but it's just to think about where the history is coming from. And so for me, it was a kind of another opportunity to see that there's another voice that's not being told in that story. And so how can we make sure that we're telling, um, telling that other side of the story and, and having people um, see that side of history as well. Um, my students actually got an opportunity uh, to make a documentary a couple of years ago. And so I wanted to share this with you guys. Please let me know if there's any issues with the sound. Um, okay. For me, I think it's that we're just like anybody else. We, a lot of people might think that we still ride horses. That's what I've like personally have encountered from people where I've gone to Vegas for basketball. They think I still live in a teepee or um, ride horses, but we're just like any other people or any other um, culture, race, we're all equal. So. We are up to technology and not going to school on horses or living in teepees as like, people like 15 miles north think that we do. Cool people that people think we are, like we don't live in teepees and we're all good people, just like everyone else. We're very stereotypical on what a Native American should look like. We're not all the same people. Um, <laughs> we're really, really different in like cultural, culturally we're really different. Physically, we're really different now. I learned that there's more than one culture of Native Americans, and there's a lot of different things to know about each culture. Like, not all, each culture does the same thing as the other ones. Emotionally, we're all really different. I'm thinking back to a long time ago, was, I've always heard suicide was not a big thing. And now it, in the Indian community, in Indian country, it's it's big. It's It's another epidemic. It's like... The, the smallpox, it's, it just spread it quick. They always try to group us in one big group because we're totally different, like East and West Coast, totally different stuff. The challenges I face is being a typical Indian. <laughs> the, the whole al being an alcoholic, growing up to be an alcoholic, I'm just, I stay on the res, I'm gonna do, do bad, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a crime, I'm so a criminal of some sort. I'm not gonna go anywhere. And I'm, I'm just really gonna go down a dark path. Like a lot of people think Native Americans are like sleazy and drunks and like to steal, but not all of them are like that. And I don't know, a lot of people think that Native Americans can't go further in the world and are gonna fail and stuff like that. All the, most of the Indians are drinking and stuff. You can see them, they're all out in the open. And pretty much when you grow up in that environment, you start to drink at a young age and it just takes you over. Like trying to fight off the drugs, like everybody just dances around the reservation and stuff like that. I feel like I must underestimated a lot because it's stereotyped that Native Americans drink and that they're going to be drug addicts and alcoholics and not go to college, not go to school. And I have hopes and dreams. My siblings have hopes and dreams and I have, I hold them to a big expectation like my grandmother held me to. And, you know, I want to go to college. I want to build a career. I want to be a lawyer. I want to make this big life for myself. And, most people don't think I can do that just because of being Native American. My future, I hope to go to college and then maybe help with my culture and teach my kids about the culture and stuff. Be successful and hopefully get a scholarship to go play basketball somewhere. I hope to become a first grade teacher and 
feel like I can be really successful at that. Um, I want to play basketball. I want to go to college, play basketball. To, well, play basketball, and if not, to be an architect. I want to go to like college for like baseball and basketball. My hope for the future is that um, we're really looked at differently. We're accepted a lot more. People know us a bit more. Um, just that people actually see who we are and that we're not just like these dirty savages. Um, I just really hope that our people are known. I hope that we can rebuild our culture to be as big as it used to be. My family's always been really big into my culture and we follow, like we go to ceremonies and sometimes we still speak our language and you know, I still learn a bunch of stuff and I want to get the younger generation into that so that we don't lose it. I want to thank each of you for uh, letting me show that and watching that. Um, I think it's super powerful when we let our students um, speak. And so this was done in an English classroom with an outside group that came into our school a couple years ago. And it's, I, I love watching it, knowing um, where a lot of those students, what they're doing now and how they've tried to give back to their community. Um, several of those students were members of the warrior movement, which um, has really been trying to address um, anti-suicide kind of mission. Um, and others have been um, really big in the MMIW. And so I've got another just kind of pride moment picture of one of our students. And so that was uh, Lorencia who was talking at the end of the video there. Um, and she's now on a billboard that I get to see every day on my drive to work. Um, so, you know, as, as I'm trying to just lay out why it's important that we're incorporating Indian Ed into our everyday classrooms, this is just one of many examples. Um, I, it, yeah, I'm just very proud of all these students that were willing to share their stories and, and their aspirations. Um, so another thing when we think about how it mixes with science, um, I love this quote um, from Robin Wall Kimmerer, and if you haven't had an opportunity to read Braiding Sweetgrass, I highly recommend it as it's a great blending of traditional knowledge and Western science. And so to be native to a place, we must learn to speak its language. Um, you know, and I, and I think kind of touching on what Mr. Lyons was talking about, a lot of our ancestors as non-Indigenous people um, they haven't been here as long, but they've been in the United States for, for quite a while. And in order for us to be native to the land as well, we really need to think about what the land's saying. And so who better to get that information than from people uh, who've been here for thousands and thousands of years and who have been making those observations and combining their traditional knowledge and really Western science um, before that was a thing. And, and we now have access to a lot of that information and can share that information. So when I think about how Indian Ed for All plays a role in science, I think of if we, if we break it down, the NGSS standards are really about science and they're about engineering. And so within science, we look at questions and how those questions are based on observations or phenomena that we might uh, see in the world. And then in engineering, we're trying to fix a problem for a human need. Well, traditional knowledge is the blending of this they had human needs that were being answered with questions and created with questions. And so when we think about things like wildlife management, traditionally Native Americans and the indigenous people of the United States had, do, had been doing wildlife management long before we called it wildlife management. And when we think about migration patterns and the understanding of migration from a Western science thing, we might look at why are animals moving within traditional knowledge, it was a matter of needing to know where those animals were moving and then with that came the knowledge of why. And so to me, traditional knowledge fits in this nice spot where it's giving us the Western science pieces we need, plus incorporating um, solving a problem that they had at the time. And we can then use that information as we move forward looking at our new um, science standards. Um, so in the Montana science content standards, the big difference between that and the next generation science standards is we have incorporated American Indians into several of what are called the DCIs, which are the disciplinary core ideas. 
Um, let me just take a peek here. Um, so some examples of what that looks like. We've got one, like, so these are directly taken from the Montana science content standards. So this one says, analyze scientific concepts used by American Indians to maintain healthy relationships with environmental resources, investigating how American Indian tribes use scientific knowledge in managing their resources and investigating and explaining perspectives um, on changes in environmental conditions. So these are kind of three that I handpicked because these are three that I primarily cover. But when you look in the Montana science content standards, what you're gonna see is in several of them, this addition of um, the need to discuss and talk about American Indians. And so how can we do that in a respectful manner and what resources should we be using um, to incorporate that? And that's kind of where we're gonna head now. So, how do we go about integrating them? I, I break this into three steps and I'm gonna show you a little bit about where to find and how to do some of these things. And then at the end, I'm gonna take you to a resource that I created um, where you can get a little bit more information. But the first thing, the first key is making sure that we're using primary documents. I noticed some people mentioned how um, excited they were to have access to the 1775 treaty and how it can be difficult to find these primary documents. And so I'm going to show you a couple of resources and places that I've looked, um, more specific to the science classes that I teach. Um, but that's going to be step one. The second one is when we're in integrating Indian Ed for All, it's really just about focusing on those essential understandings. And, and Zach mentioned one earlier, um, history's perspective, and really that story that I was telling about in Sign Peak, that's what that was about. It's the idea that history is very subjective and it's based on the perception of the individual storyteller that's telling that history. Um, but we're going to look at a few of those other ones and how they might in integrate into a science classroom. Um, and then finally, when I think about science, I mentioned the DCIs, which are the disciplinary core ideas. But really, when it comes into integration to make it really complete, I, I think it's better to focus on the science practices. And that is the, um, the actual science skills that scientists do every day. And so along with the the content, the core ideas that we're supposed to teach, we're also supposed to teach our students the science practices and also supposed to teach the cross-cutting concepts. So that's kind of that idea there. Uh, okay, so primary documents and resources. Where I usually start is I try to find videos, reports, tribally owned and ran websites or quotes that actually come from the tribes themselves. So a great starting point is going to the tribal websites and seeing what documentations and documents they have uploaded. For, for where I teach, I primarily use CSKT documents, but I've also gone to other websites or other tribal colleges and got information. Um, one of the activities I do involves looking at wildlife management. And so I use the, there's a wolf documentation of how the CSKT plan and, and handle incidents with wolves on the reservation and how they wanna manage the wolf population. Well, in doing that, I realized that that was only the perspective of this one tribe and I wanted to compare, uh, or one group, sorry, three tribes, but wanted to compare their, their governmental policies, obviously with the state of Montana, but I also went out and found other documents. And so I found that the Colville tribes in Washington on their reservation, they also have documentation about how to manage wolves. And so that was one example of where I just started Googling and, and looking on the tribal websites to find information that was pretty successful. Um, so that's that tribal website. And a lot of the tribes will have natural resource and wildlife management departments. And then I'm gonna share some of the CSKT online education materials um, here at the end and show you where you can go to find some great information um, that's designed for teachers to use specifically. Another place that I found a lot of good stuff is just going on YouTube. Um, and OPI's got a, a page on there and then also the Montana Experience are just two examples. Um, there's a lot of other good examples though of channels that you can get um, indigenous knowledge from and use with your students. So this is one example of using a primary doc. Uh, I'm gonna just give you guys a second to, to read uh, this part. So this is an excerpt from the Hellgate Treaty of 1855.
So as Mr. Lyons mentioned, um, the importance of, of treaties um, with the CSKT, their treaty was the Hellgate Treaty of 1855. And so we like to use that document with our students at the school. And in this instance, this piece of the, the treaty, which is Article 3, talks about fishing and hunting and gathering rights. The language that we see in this treaty has been used for the tribe to get funding to help um, manage their wildlife. Also during times of lawsuits, so ARCO was sued um, in 1998. There was a settlement um, between the state of Montana, but also the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes with ARCO for the damage that was done on the upper Clark, uh, Clark Fork River Basin. And some of that funding then went to the tribe because of the treaty and has been used for restoration of the Jocko watershed. And also they're doing a restoration project in the Moes area um, on the reservation to restore bull trout habitat and to help maintain the land um, back to its natural state. And so this is just one example of how we can talk about and have our kids read about the treaties. Um, in my wildlife class, I had several tribal members that had never read this particular passage of that treaty. And so that was really uh, fun to share with them a piece of the treaty that was signed by, by their tribe. Um, one thing to note about the, the treaty period, and, and that's really many of these treaties were created before states were created. And so what we run into in Montana is this treaty was, was formed with the federal government and the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. And there's um, been some contention then with the state and the tribe. And that has to do with the fact that the state wasn't in existence when the treaty was, was signed. And so um, that plays a role in that sovereign part and why it's important to teach our students about sovereignty and why it's important to treat, teach our students about um, the Hellgate Treaty or any treaty. So the Hellgate Treaty is an example of um, what would they call Stevens Treaty because it came from Isaac Stevens, who's the governor of the Washington Territory. And then the Blackfeet and the tribes in eastern, east of the divide are part of the um, Fort Laramie Treaties, I believe of like 1871, if I'm not mistaken. So why I think it's important we focus on the essential understandings and not um, other specific pieces um, is really because it allows us to make sure that we're talking about multiple perspectives, as I mentioned, not just one tribe, um, but as many tribes as possible, plus showing them how that view might differ from like the state of Montana and how they manage or the federal government and how they manage animals, um, demonstrating the importance of culture. And as I just said, making sure our students understand that idea of sovereignty. So if we just think about the seven essential understandings, I'm gonna throw the first four up I try to like break them into pieces that are easier for me to, to understand than, than sometimes the whole language. Um, it's important that we're obviously talking about the diversity among tribes. And you could see in that video how our students were, were saying that Native Americans have been just lumped into these categories of all being the same. And they were very adamant that they are different and they come from different tribes and they're different individually. Um, today, you saw those students talking about how they still are practicing their culture. And so there's a lot of misconceptions. And so this is one way to break down those misconceptions and those barriers that there's still culture um, being practiced today. Talking about the importance of reservations and the idea that the, the tribe ceded away a lot of their land for a small amount of land in these treaties, um, but that's their land. And then during different periods of time, we have, um, and I'll get to that, I guess, during different periods, these federal policy periods, we had things like the Allotment Act. So on the Flathead Reservation, the, a lot of the land was, was sold away from the tribe. And, and so now we, we see this changing happening on the reservation where they're trying to buy back a lot more of their land. Um, but these policy periods played a huge role in the, the formation and the shape of the reservations. With that, we had the treaty period, which I mentioned, um, signing those treaties prior to states being in existence, a lot of them. And then that allotment period and really the assimilation period where we had boarding schools and things like that and that idea of trying to remove the culture. And so it's important that our students understand those different federal policy periods and how they play a role in, um, in our lives today. I've mentioned several times why it's important to use Indian Ed for All and the idea that history is very subjective and trying to get a different voice in our classrooms than just the voice that's in our textbooks. 
in science, that voice typically is from Western scientists. And so I look for opportunities to how can I in, incorporate another voice um, into the conversation. And so when we're looking at things like the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel, um, we can talk about how selective breeding for, for plants has been going on for a lot longer than, than that. And, and we didn't use the same terminology, but tribal people were, were taking certain crops at certain times for certain reasons. And, and uh, that, type of, that type of perspective should be shared with our students. And then again, the idea that tribes are sovereign nations and that they have treaties that are with the federal government. And so they are their own government. Um, and so with, with that, then we get into now the science practices and how we're gonna focus on these, these eight things really. Um, so I, the eight main things we got, I'll go four at a time again. All scientists are asking questions and defining problems. All of them are developing and using models, planning and carrying out investigations and analyzing and interpreting data. So we wanna focus on how can we take these practices that scientists are doing and talk about some of that traditional knowledge that was attained in the same fashion and show that overlap to our students. The other four practices are using math, computational thinking, constructing explanations, engaging in argument, and obtaining and evaluating um, information. And so I've created a couple different lesson plans and then I'll share after the two that, I, that I've got on my website. Uh, I'll share some different ideas of things that I've started to piece together and that I just haven't created formal documents for yet. But really the key then is when we're integrating Indian Ed for All, we want to make sure that we're doing the three things, which would be making sure that we're using primary sources or information coming directly from the tribes. Um, again, checking out their websites is usually a great place to start. If that isn't if you're not finding what you're looking for, reaching out to the tribes themselves, they usually have an education department, reaching out to OPI's Indian Ed Division, reaching out to teachers on reservations, um, as a lot of them have extra resources as well. Um, once we have those resources, then thinking about how we're gonna integrate specific, uh, the essential concepts, with the science practices and making sure that we're handpicking maybe one or two to focus on with our students, even though we might be focusing or hitting more than that. So real quick, I'm gonna jump over to uh, this first resource and there'll be a link uh, to this resource in the chat. So this is a website that I created um, that OPI helped uh, fund through a grant at the school that I work at. And so it's really about why we're integrating Indian Ed for All, how to, and then some examples. So there's some good resources that I've tried to put on here and I will hopefully be adding some of these integrated lessons um, that I'm working on currently. But I just wanted to kind of go through a couple main things that are on here. So first, when we go into the how to integrate, you'll see those same bullets that I just kind of talked about and why um, it's important to do that in Montana and the fact that we actually have content standards that require us by law to integrate Indian Ed for All into our classrooms. I have linked some primary documents that I've used. These are long documents, a lot of them. I recommend going in and handpicking the parts that could be useful. Maybe it's a quote from an elder, maybe it's the mission statement, whatever that piece is. But you can see I've got a couple different wolf management plans. Um, the Blackfeet Climate Change Plan and the CSKT Climate Change Plan. These are extensive documents, hundreds of pages long. And so, it's, like I said, it's important that you kind of go through and see um, what information could be useful. I also have several different um, videos that could be shown um, to your class with some context. So one, um, this first one um, by Shani, she's talking about how culture plays a role in her um, education as a scientist and how she does her research. And so she's using obviously Western science to get this degree, but how that plays a role in traditional knowledge. And it's a great video and a great resource you could share with your students. Um, there, the CSKT has done a lot of videos on the story of bison. And so that's one example. We've got elders videos. Um, and then there's a field guide and I'll show you that again um, here in a little bit. But the idea is trying to get resources with the voice of tribal elders and, and the tribes um, 
into that, that resource. A couple other things that could be really useful, and you can find these on OPI's website as well, but this evaluating American Indian materials. So if you're just starting in your journey of trying to find primary documents and you're just not sure, or if you're looking at a book that you might wanna use with your students that talks about Native American culture or perspective, this document that OPI has put together can kind of help walk you through making sure that the materials are appropriate for your students. Um, so I also have two fully created and integrated lessons on here. And like I mentioned, I'm working on a few others that uh, I've, I've done in my classroom, but they're not quite as uh, fleshed out as these ones. The first one is a climate change lesson plan which would have your students looking at multiple perspectives um, and how to manage uh, our current situation with climate change. And so you can see if you go onto the website, you can just download the full lesson plans and you've got some PDFs that have all the data and materials that you would need um, to do that. And there's videos um, integrated with these lesson plans and different things, different um, perspective uh, from the tribes. I also put together one about wildlife crossings. And so if you're familiar with the Flathead Reservation as you're traveling north um, from Missoula um, on Highway 93, you'll get, when you get close to the casino, you're gonna notice a, a walking bridge for animals. And then there's gonna be a lot of big fencing you're gonna notice. The tribe worked with the Montana Department of Transportation and other organizations for quite some time in putting in a lot of animal crossing structures in order to minimize the impacts of vehicles and humans and wildlife. Um, and so I put together a lesson where it really has students look at the fact that there is a problem with humans hitting animals and how that uh, uh, disrupts migration patterns and the cost, the financial cost of, of having these accidents occur and really looking at um, ways that these animal crossings can be utilized um, to help minimize this problem and then if it's financially worth it and so it has us look at from the from a tribal scientist standpoint um, what's the cost benefit when we're talking about um, animals versus property damage and how they weigh that out versus maybe how um, how the state of Montana might look at it which might be completely different so anyway so these two lessons are up on the website and they're there for you guys to download and and mess around with and make changes and contact me and say, hey, I tried this and this didn't work very well. Do you have any other ideas? Um, but I just wanna share that. And, and like I said, I primarily have used these with high schoolers, but they can be modified. Um, so that's, that's my website. Um, the other one that I really wanted to share is the Confederate Association Kootenai Tribes have always had some outstanding digital um, lesson plans, but they were all on CDs and DVDs. And during COVID, they were able to update a lot of those resources. And these are phenomenal resources that are now um, online for us to use. And so I'm sure many of you are familiar um, with Fire on the Land and Explore the River. Um, they were, I think every library in Montana um, at the schools had these discs for teachers to use they've now digitalized them. So for example, I do a lot with Explore the River. Um, we were right next to the Jocko, so it works out really well for me. I can walk down there during a class period and get back to my classroom. Um, but you can see they've digitized it. So you have new videos that are um, updated and then you have all sorts of science material and how it ties into the culture and history of the tribes in that area. So. What I would recommend doing, because it's pretty dense material and there's a lot, is just getting on, clicking on as many things as you can and trying to think of how you can incorporate a little bit of this into your classroom, um, you know, in the future. And knowing that it's coming from the tribes themselves, the resource has been vetted by them and it's got the culturally significant information that we'd want to share with our kiddos. Um, the other links on here, same thing with Fire on the Land. And then the lower Flathead River map um, talks a lot about the animals and the plants that are in the area and that you can click on the different pieces and it gives you more information and a lot about restoration. Um, and there's been activities on these about restoring um, rivers and what that takes. And the tribe's been doing a lot of restoration work with that, that money from ARCO that I mentioned um, earlier. 
The other two big resources, um, the field guide, if you're not familiar with it, it's an app you can download. I have it on my cell phone. Um, it is more relevant to the animals in, in Western Montana. What is nice about it, it has the names of the animals in Salish and in Kootenai it, um, spoken by elders. And so you can hear the names um, that way for people that are not indigenous speakers. It also has cultural significance of the animal and how they're being impacted by climate change. So this becomes a great resource that you could quickly use. If nothing else, you could use it for students to do quick research on animals and get a cultural perspective on that animal, no matter what part of Montana you lived in. Um, so that could be a useful app to download. The Living Landscapes um, and Climate Project is very dense. There's a lot of stuff. And so I would recommend going on there for sure and just playing around. But I wanted to show you, um, for example, just a couple of these short, so they have these episodes that go along with different topics. And it also is regional. So this could be used really in any part of the United States. They have information. For Montana, you'd either be in the plateau or the plains region, depending on if you're east of the divide or not. But um, you can see that these were made by the tribe with tribal members in the video. So I'm just going to show you a clip of this one video and then um, then I'll jump off here. But this again is a more of a pride moment with one of my students who was in that other video. He got asked to do these videos and it's pretty great. This is my home, the home of Salish, Pondere, and Kootenai people for too many generations to count. I've grown up on this land, like my Schepe and his Schepe before that. My name is Riley. We're going into a wildfire to see how the climate affects a burning landscape. With ever-increasing temperatures due to climate change, severe wildfires are becoming the new norm. Ron Swaney, a fire management officer, has been fighting fire here for decades. He's seen firsthand how fire behavior has changed. Three things that cause fires to spread, fuels, weather, and topography. And uh, the only one that's the variable is the weather. We're getting hotter, we're getting drier, and the potential is, is only increasing for the wildfire based on just the climatology and the changes that have occurred. So it's been a dramatic change, uh, both in the number of fires that we get and the amount of acres that we burn. As these brave firefighters work to manage ever bigger and more frequent wildfires, it's important to remember that not all fire is bad. My Sepa tells me how the tribes use fire as a tool to care for the land. The forests were kept healthy by thousands of years of burning by our ancestors. Respect the fire, use it in a good way. It'll help you. So with the huckleberries, the, the people knew this a long time ago. Yeah. And they, they burn back, so in a few years they get back to that berry patch and the berries are bigger and cleaner. And it makes food for all the animals out there too to, to come in. It's kind of a natural thing, you know, for the fire burning. He says there was a position of great honor in the tribe, that of Spram, the one who makes fire. The old ways are still relevant. What the Spram used to do they now call prescribed burns. They are the same thing, lighting fires at a time of year when it will help the forest instead of hurting it. So I just wanted to share, like that's just one three minute little video about fire. And so you can see that integration of traditional knowledge with Western science. So we have current day firefighters working on combating how climate change is impacting our forest fires. And we can see how Native Americans both in the past and currently, so that idea of you know, culture still persisting today are managing their, their forest fires and their land. So this is an awesome resource. You can see there's lots of one about grizzlies, bull trout. Um, this is just the video section of the website. There's labs, there's nine different labs in here. There's a lot of information, but it really is something you'd have to take some time um, to dive in on your own and, and look through what could be useful. Um, a lot of the labs are a little bit higher level, but you could like I said, watch those videos and at least get that perspective and what you're talking about. Um, so just the last couple of things, then I'll open it up to some last minute questions. A couple other things that I've been working on. Um, so I've got the climate change lesson plan and the wildlife crossing plan that are both on my website. 
Um, I've mentioned that I've done a lot with con comparing and contrasting tribal wildlife practices uh, with how Montana practices wildlife management. And so within the climate change lesson plan, you will see a document I put together with the mission statements of Montana's fish, wildlife, and parks, and then a document with like CSKT's um, natural uh, resource department's mission statements and how you can compare them pretty easily with your students or have them kind of role play what perspective a tribal member might have versus um, the state of Montana in regards to how we're managing our wildlife. We end up doing a debate about wildlife management in general, whether it's something we think we should be doing or not. Um, I mentioned Indian Creek Chronicles because that's a book that we read um, that's written about watching fish eggs, um, and it's pretty relatable to a lot of our students in this area. Um, another, whoops, another thing that I've been going over is we've in the past looked at traditional stories and how anthropomorphism and reciprocity is used to depict different traits and behaviors that animals have. And so we have students compare what like Western scientists says about these behaviors of the animal and how these animals are depicted in traditional stories from tribes from all over and then do like a comparis comparison um, essay on that. That's been a lot of fun. It's awesome to teach our students about reciprocity. Um, and the papers ended up turning out great. I've done court cases, Kivalina, Alaska, uh, sued ExxonMobil. They're a reservation in Alaska that um, their land was melting away. And so they sued ExxonMobil. And so that was a pretty awesome opportunity to talk about that idea of sovereign nations and their ability to sue entities um, on their own. And then I've been more recently working on some units with plant genetics and uh, traditional uses of native plants and also how um, those plants have been managed, just like that video mentioned with fire and different means. So those are some of the things that I've been working on. Um, does anybody, we have a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any questions for me? It looks like Jennifer's been throwing a lot of the resources into, um, into the chat. I also updated the folder. So I created a document that has all of the resources that Bill has discussed. Yeah, and if you guys have questions or are looking for material, like I mentioned, um, you know, I think it's really important that we just feel comfortable reaching out to people that, that can get the stuff for us. Um, which essential understanding do you think that's best for wildlife movement lesson? Okay. So yeah, so with that, um, that's a good question. So as far as the essential understandings that I usually talk about when I do like wildlife migration or wildlife management, um, one of them would be that there's diversity among tribes because we talk about the idea that each tribe has their own management um, plans and not all of them have a developed plan that you're gonna find online. Um, and again, CSKT's treaty was different. And so they're, they get, uh, they have funding coming to them that they use for that. I know that Blackfeet have been doing um, guided hunts and things to, to develop some of their funding for their um, wildlife management departments. But either way, the diversity among tribes is key there. Also the idea that culture persists today because they use a lot of uh, their understanding of how animals um, have traditionally helped with herd management and the movement of management with their practices today. So culture persists, diversity among tribes. And then I would probably say um, tribal sovereignty because they have their own plans that are putting in place. So those are probably the three that I would focus on primarily. Um, any other, let's see, do you have any resources that have important mineral rock sites? You know, I don't, but I think I could um, reach out to some people that definitely would. So I can make a list and, and Jennifer and I can work on finding some of these things for you guys. So mineral sites in the Flathead area. Primarily, um, I do biology and so you can tell that I, my earth science is a little lacking there, but I can um, definitely look into that. Any other questions? I mean, so ultimately, you know, I think it's important that, you know, when you're creating your lesson plans, really focus on making sure they're student driven, that they're current, they're relevant, 
how you can incorporate Indian Ed for All so it's not an afterthought. It should just be part of what we're teaching our students. Um, you know, listening to our students, listening to the, the people in our communities. And I think that's, that's really the key. Um, so thank you guys for spending an hour uh, listening to me talk. And it's not usually my, like I said, I like the students to do the talking, but thank you guys very much. Well, you're, you're fantastic, Bill. And thank you so much for all of your resources. And um, everyone, thank you so much for choosing this session. And um, like I said, the resources are in the Google Drive folder. So I am going to end the meeting for us now, but in 10 minutes, please do join us for a wonderful celebration of our Advocacy Award winners. Thank you so much. <laughs>